discussion as soon as possible. Um, in the meantime, you can just introduce yourself in the chat and tell us where you're coming from and which organization you are representing. I see we've also got some students here, um, a student from DUT. So welcome, thank you for joining. And there's someone in Abidjan. So well, welcome as well. And welcome Kulula from DBE. So maybe while we wait, I can also share a little bit about uh, why we're here and the virtual reading club. Um, so this is the first virtual reading club of, of 12. Um, and the virtual reading club was launched um, after President Cyril Ramaphosa's call um, to strengthen our culture of reading and cultivate a reading nation. Um, and he spoke about doing that from the classroom to the living room. Um, so it's all about inculcating a love for reading um, around across society uh, from, from the classroom to the living room. Um, and this initiative is part of, um, part of that call and part of that vision. Um, and as part of that vision, uh, the National Reading Coalition was launched in 2019. Um, and what the National Reading Coalition does is it links together different organizations around the country that are working to improve literacy and also strengthen our reading culture. Um, it links those organizations and those reading clubs together. Um, and this virtual reading club is also part of the president's initiative, which he calls the president's reading circle. Um, and the challenge from the president is to read one book a month. Um, and so we are starting to take on that challenge through this virtual reading club. This is the first meeting um, and we're planning on having a monthly one for the next 12 months. That's so the minister has joined us for your information and you could get back to your program. Thank you, Godwin. Uh, welcome, Minister. Great, thank you everyone for joining and we apologize for the late start. Um, so as I was uh, speaking about before, this is the first virtual reading club that is hosted by the Department of Education, the National Reading Coalition, Nali Bali and the National Library of South Africa. Um, my name is Catherine Woodley and I'll be facilitating the discussion today. Um, and it's great to see a whole lot of people um, in the chat introduce themselves from organizations and in the personal capacity around the country. Um, we're also joined by three distinguished panelists for this first virtual reading club session. Um, so we'd like to welcome Honorable Minister Angie Motseja, the Minister of Basic Education, uh, Professor Chilizi Marwala, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Johannesburg, and Mr. Godwin Corsa, who's the Chief Executive Officer of the NECT, the National Education Collaboration Trust. Um, thank you all for making time to attend this event. Um, so before we start off with the conversation, I'd just like to run through some of the etiquette and the protocol for the virtual meeting. Um, please keep your cameras off and your microphones muted for the duration of the meeting. It just limits the distractions that we have during the meeting. Um, if you would like to make a comment or ask a question during the meeting, you're welcome to use the chat function. 
Um, and especially we encourage that during the discussion that will happen on the actual book. Um, and we also encourage you to share your thoughts on social media. You can use the hashtag, hashtag VRC, which is for Virtual Reading Club. Um, I've already shared some background on the Virtual Reading Club, so I won't go into detail, um, into detail about it. But just to encourage you to sign up if you haven't already, sign up to the President's Reading Circle. Um, you can find the link on the NRC website, which is nrc.org.za. Um, I think since we've started late, um, I will jump straight into introducing our speakers. Um, so how it will work is I'll give them a brief introduction. They will have five to 10 minutes to share some opening remarks and then we'll start the book discussion. Um, so our first speaker is Minister Angie Motecha. Um, Minister has, Angie Motecha has served as the Minister of Basic Education since 2009. She's also a member of the African National Congress Na National Executive Committee. Uh, Minister Motecha was an educator at Orlando High School from 1981 to 1983, a lecturer at the Soweto College of Education from 1983 to 1985, and a lecturer at Wits University from 1985 to 1994. She's also served as director in the office of the president from 1994 to 97, Deputy Secretary of the ANC Women's League from 97 to 2007, and as an executive member of the National Education Union of South Africa. She holds a master's degree from Wits University, a Bachelor of Educational Science degree from the University of, oh, from Wits University as well, a Bachelor of Arts in Education from the University of the North, and a higher diploma in education. Um, so welcome Minister, and thank you for joining us today. You can share your opening remarks when you're ready. No, thank you very much, facilitator. And let me thank you most sincerely for enabling us to participate in this reading coalition. It is for us a real great uh, a moment to participate in this reading cycle. It is, and we call it the President's Virtual Book Club because as you correctly indicated before that it's the president who also echoed our calls to make South Africans a reading nation that whilst we ramp up reading culture in our schools, but it, we will really want to encourage the whole population to really be a reading population so that children can see parents reading, can see brothers reading, and the whole culture of reading is not only in the classroom, but it becomes a national culture. And just because we don't have time, I could have even shared some of the statistics. We have around countries that are performing in the world, how really, what makes a difference between those that are non-performing in reading and those that are performing in reading. And the common denominator amongst all of them, like your Russia as the most advanced reading country, it says almost 65% of Russians are readers and 65 are advanced readers and 85 are readers. In our country, the converse. As South Africans were said, only 15% of us read and the rest of the nation, even if those that even those that can read don't read, and which is a problem. So I do hope that this circle will help us to encourage most people to read in their homes, to read everywhere else, and to create this culture or this reading revolution in the nation. So it really it is a, 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 the president is a passionate and veteran reader. He reports that he reads up to 50 something books a year. And we really do want young people to at least, maybe not two books, just one book a, a, a month and share a, a experiences, critique books together, but also make such an enjoyable platform where we can interact, we can critique readers, we can critique books. We can also exchange books because books can be expensive. When we grew up, we used to have reading circles where people must really share books as part of their cultures and get a book to rotate and revolve around so many people. So the president indeed has called us upon, had called upon us to read. And for me, from the work that we've been doing with the reading, with NECT, the Reading Coalition, 
your library and all your other organizations like Nadi Bali who have been working with us. We see this as a fusion center, which brings together all the reading cultures. And stakeholders coming here, I think should take this as a social initiative that intends to change the lives and the reading culture in our country. And it's meant to help us to address the root causes of reading challenges, because we say, as a country, we have reading challenges in our schools because we have a national reading challenge. And therefore, through this process, we really want to encourage all South Africans to join this platform, get us, even as adult South Africans, to start reading for pleasure so that even our young people or, young, or just the nation in general can emulate uh, leaders. And I'm glad that we have people like Prof. And when young people uh, <laughs> from his institution, other institutions, see prof also just reading for culture not reading science books but just reading for pleasure they'll begin to enjoy books but let me also thank the ngos that have been helping us they've really made this a very meaningful process and thank you very much facilitator i don't want to take your time but i'm very pleased and humbled that we have reached the stage where we can launch this uh, coalition and i'm really looking forward to great things coming from it and getting more and more people to participate in this platform and just continue to, 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 to improve the culture of reading amongst our people. Thank you very much, Eche, facilitate. Thank you very much, Minister, uh, for those opening comments. Uh, it is definitely a very exciting moment to be launching the Virtual Book Club. Um, so our second speaker is Godwin Corsa. Godwin is the Chief Executive Officer of the National Education Collaboration Trust, the NECT, and he was appointed in 2013. He was previously CEO and Program Director, respectively, at Jet Education Services. Um, the early 2000s saw Godwin honing his research skills as a research manager of the Human Sciences Research Council. And prior to this, Godwin served as a policy analyst and senior manager at the Center for Education Policy Development. Godwin holds a Master's of Management, specializing in public and development management from WITS, um, a postgraduate diploma in public policy and administration, also from WITS, a BA Honors in Geography from UNISA, and a BA Education from the University of the North. Um, Godwin is currently a second year PhD candidate with the University of Sussex. Thank you, Godwin, for joining us. Um, please, could you also share your opening remarks? Well, thank you, Catherine. Uh, interesting, you know, uh, introduction. You reminded me of where I've been in the past couple of years or decades, actually. <clears throat> and I'm very close to uh, finishing all the universities in South Africa <laughs> from one to the other. But I think the most interest, interesting introduction was that of the minister, uh, her being a teacher and a lecturer at a, a VETS and so on. And I think her commitment to teaching continues in all the things that she, she does, uh, particularly uh, minister's love for reading and support for reading in the department and around the work that she does. Um, and in that respect, you know, Minister launched a campaign to improve, you know, reading in and around schools uh, called the Read to Lead campaign, uh, which essentially is meant to support the technical work of improving reading that happens in the classroom, uh, which is done through teachers um, and essentially between the interface between teachers and, and learners. Uh, I want to latch on that because um, that, that is the primary reason why we have the reason we have the, the, the NRC, the National Reading Coalition, which was founded and rather launched on in February 2019, you know, aimed to support the Read to Lead campaign, which continues to uh, promote uh, reading. And um, the president, as you know, has added his word and provide, is providing, you know, quite, you know, instructive leadership on how, you know, reading should be supported from the broader community into the environment within which we teach our kids. Uh, but most importantly, uh, amongst the teachers that teach our kids to read. 
uh, and the whole understanding is that we actually will not full take full potential of the impact of reading if we don't inculcate the love for books and the love for reading. So it's on that basis that the National you know, Reading Coalition was launched in February 2019. And ever since then, the National Reading Coalition is being coordinated through the National Education Collaboration Trust, has been mobilizing more and more partners to get involved in the, um, the agenda to improve reading. I mean, the president has put it correctly as creating a reading movement so that parents, teachers, and the broader communities could reinforce the culture of, you know, loving to read. So the NRC has, you know, certain specific strategies that it is um, pursuing. One of those um, has been to work with provinces uh, to identify 25% of the education circuits, which are about 256 circuits, you know, in the country, um, where partners are encouraged to fast track the process of, you know, taking out books from the closets, encouraging reading at home, encouraging reading, you know, amongst, you know, neighbors and communities, establishing reading clubs, and it's in the same vein that the National Libraries is doing, promoting um, uh, the establishment of, uh, you know, reading uh, clubs across the country. We have, uh, you know, established uh, with the department many reading clubs across the country, and we know that the National Library has established over a thousand reading libraries. We have also, you know, um, you know, gotten involved in establishing reading clubs amongst, you know, circuit managers and, and principals. And one of the interesting models is where um, a given circuit manager would establish a reading club with their principals and, and they would choose a book to read. And the beauty about it is that once you start doing that, then you have, um, you have a whole group of school principals who are starting to share a language um, with each other and with their circuit manager and uh, that helps to build the team, it helps to build relationships, but it also helps to, um, you know, drive the strategy of improving education in each of the, of the, um, of the, of the circuits. So the president has particularly, um, you know, directed that uh, a read, his reading cycle be established and the NRC has supported the president initiative by setting up the mic a microsite, uh, which you, I believe many of you have visited or you can visit. Uh, it's www.nrc.ac, I'm sorry, .co.za. You can see my, uh, my love of the academia, uh, Professor Marwala. Uh, I tend to throw AC instead of, uh, um, uh, sorry, org. So, let me start again, www.nrc.org.za. So you could visit um, the, the, the microsite. It has, it has been established solely for the purposes of supporting the president's challenge. And we know that uh, by last week, we had about 908 registered individuals and book clubs across the country. There are many book clubs and the whole idea as Catherine has indicated, is to take, um, you know, take on the president on his challenge to have South Africans read one book, uh, you know, per month. Uh, it's not all you have to read, you can read a whole lot more. And uh, we thought that we could work together with other uh, partners, Nalibali and National Reading, I mean, National Libraries, to identify a book, you know, um, every month and get South Africans to read, review the book, talk about it, and, and, and you can imagine the benefits that come around that. All of a sudden, we have something common to talk about around dinner tables, provided with social distance, by the way. Um, and, and, and I think it's, it's just necessary in a, in a nation to, for a nation to find you know, other things to relax, um, to talk about, to drive conversations, and, and in that manner, we think that 
will contribute to building you know, social cohesion. Uh, books are one way in which we could get people talking across class, across race, across gender. Uh, in families, we could get families talking a little more. Uh, we, could we could have uh, students in universities talking to their professors and their vice chancellors, like Professor Marwala does in uh, the University of Johannesburg. And it's on that note that I just want to share, um, I think, a very commendable um, uh, um, uh, program from the University of Johannesburg. Prof. Marwala reads a book every month and he shares that with staff and, and students and he invites guest readers and reviewers and, and that sort of thing. And he has kept on average a following of a 70 students and staff who come to his a, you know, reading clubs. We know that there are many such reading clubs, but we thought that for a start, we could ask a Prof. Marwala to be part of this a launch of the reading club. We're looking forward to identifying more reading clubs and, and partnering with them across the country to promote the culture of reading around our classrooms, around our schools, and across the country. So it's on that uh, basis that uh, um, we have uh, chosen to take this challenge uh, in response to the president's call. Thank you very much, Kathleen. Thank you, Karen. Um, so I think you've led nicely into Prof. Chilizi Marwala's uh, opening remarks. I'll just give a brief introduction for him. So Professor Marwala is an accomplished scholar multidisciplinary research interests that include the theory and application of artificial intelligence um, to fields like engineering, computer science, finance, social science, and medicine. He has an extensive track record in human capacity development and has published more than 15 books on artificial intelligence and related topics. Prof. Marwala is currently the Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of Johannesburg. And prior to that, he was the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research and Internationalization and Executive Dean of Engineering and the Built Environment, both at UJ. He was recently appointed as Deputy Chair of the Presidential Commission on the Fourth Industrial Revolution. He has received more than 45 awards, including the Order of Mapungubwe, and was a delegate to the 1989 London International Youth Science Fortnight when he was in high school. His writings and opinions have appeared in the magazines New Scientist, The Economist, Time Magazine, and CNN. Welcome, Prof. Marwala. Please could you share with us your opening remarks? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Catherine. Uh, Honorable Minister, uh, I, I have to congratulate you for, for this very important uh, initiative for the development of our country. I also would like to thank Godwin Corsa, uh, a, a passionate educator, a member of uh, uh, the University of Johannesburg Council uh, for this uh, initiative. I am reminded of the expression, those who do not read, must not lead. Reading is a fundamental building block for building a strong democratic country. Democracies that are made of a population that is illiterate or that does not read shall die. This was the reason why literacy is important. In my reading club at the University of Johannesburg this year, I read 10 books uh, for staff students at the University of Johannesburg, as well as anybody who is interested, whether they are at the University of Johannesburg or they are outside. Some of the books that I have read included uh, Americana, uh, uh, Purple Hibiscus, that uh, these are two books that uh, have been written by um, Chimamanda. I also read Things Fall Apart. And of course, these three books, Americana, Purple, Hibiscus, and Things Fall Apart, are set at the same place in Iboland in Nigeria. 
albeit in a, at a different time. Another book which I read also was The Beautiful Ones Are Not Yet Born. Indeed, these beautiful ones shall not be born unless we make reading an integral part of our culture. One of the reasons that explained the industrialization of England, England was actually the culture of reading. As the University of Johannesburg, we are excited about uh, this initiative and we hope to support it in any way uh, that uh, you deem fit so that we can be able to take our society into a society that reads, a society that reads widely. Because it is not just reading that is important. It is also reading widely. A society that understands the values that are so important as we move into the fourth industrial revolution. The values of communication cannot be inculcated without reading. The values of logical thinking cannot be inculcated into our culture without reading. So I'm quite uh, looking forward uh, to discussing um, um, uh, Americana and also uh, looking forward to supporting this initiative in the future. I thank you very much. Nyabonga. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, thank you to all the speakers for laying the groundwork and establishing the importance of developing a reading culture um, throughout the whole of society. And thank you all for sharing um, some of the initiatives that are already happening around the country in line with this vision that was articulated by the president. Um, so now we'll move on to the actual discussion of the book. Um, and how this will work is we will be exploring some of the themes in the novel and um, personal reflections or experiences of the book. We'd like the discussion to be as interactive as possible. Um, so I will be asking the panelists specific questions. And if you would like to add a thought or ask a question, please post it in the chat and we will be monitoring it throughout the conversation um, and drawing on some, some of the questions, some of the comments. We will integrate that into our discussion. Um, so I think I'll kick off the discussion with just a general question. So this is addressed to any of the panelists, whoever feels like answering first can answer first. Um, so the question is, what was your overall experience of the book? Let me start off and say, you know, going through the book, it felt like I had met Ngozi. It really felt so familiar she felt like she's another fiesty woman that I had met before who told it as is, but was just as human and as real. It really felt such a real story, whether the setting was in Nigeria, but it really spoke to me about race, about all the complexes from inferior to superiority complexes that we have as people, whether you a, 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 a Gauteng or a Jobeka who feels better than anybody who comes from a rural place, but it really felt so familiar and so funny. But it also felt so deep in some instances where there were things that I think as a human being, you want to deny things about sexism, how women are treated, and half the time you want to ready to, 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 to maintain your sanity to say, you know what, these are small matters, but deep down, you know, they're not small matters. And it's things that half the time you, 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 you want to, to resist. Uh, stories of professor hitting other professors, it just felt for me that I mean, growing up in the township, that there are times where you even feel like, uh, even as a minister, that I just feel like clapping this one. But you know you can't do it. It will just have such ripple effects. But it's such a well-written book in many respects. It touches different aspects of what it means to be, to be Black, what it means to be African, what it means to be 
poor, uh, having dead lots, knocking at you rudely. But what it means also to be a very troubled mother that sometimes you want a, a refugee that can help you put your children in line. Therefore, you run to Christianity and threaten everybody with God and devil because sometimes you feel really you, you've lost control or you're just not able to, 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 to speak calmly to your kids to get them to do the right things. But as I say, it just felt so familiar. It felt, yeah, it felt so good, but also that parts of the books which really made me feel sad as, as, as an African woman to say, this is real and this is what our lives are. And this is it about sexism, this is it about racism, but this is it about class. But that is also being in government, this is it about governance. How corruption destroys people's lives, how lack of systems where people can be fired because somebody didn't call either minister mommy and what the impacts what its impacts are on other human beings but also being in government it just for me struck a very sad chord about power also and and money also about greed yeah so i can go in on but that, that's how i felt that it really spoke to me so i said it felt like another woman i know down the road who's seen it all and who's telling it as is and but who's real also had her life stories, had her love stories, had lovers, had yeah, it, it just really felt like I've I've seen I've had I've seen this woman before and she's seen it all. So I think it's a beautiful book. Mm, thank you so much, Minister, for those reflections. I think you've touched on so many themes <laughs> just in your opening reflections. Um, and we'll definitely be discussing some of those more in depth as we go along. Um, I really like what you said about the book or the main character feeling familiar um, and I'd like to hear what Prof Marwala and Godwin thought about that, about the character, about uh, just the book in general. What was your experience as you read it? Was it an enjoyable read? No thanks. Uh, I, as the minister has already indicated, it felt very familiar. Uh, uh, obviously I, I, I was an undergraduate student uh, in North America so the experience that she experienced when she was there, whether she was in Baltimore or whether she was in, uh, in Massachusetts, um, was actually exactly the experience that I, I felt when I was in Cleveland, Ohio for, for four years. And of course, uh, the issue of, uh, of uh, Obinze when he was uh, in England, uh, uh, I, was a, I was a doctoral student there the issues of migration, visas expiring and people still in the country and having to go to home affairs and, and being deported as um, Obinze was deported. Uh, also felt uh, quite familiar because uh, I know people who, who would have gone through that. But also, uh, uh, as I've already indicated, I read this book uh, uh, after I read uh, uh, Purple Hibiscus and uh, Things Fall Apart. Things Fall Apart was about a community that was trying to resist the encroachment of the British in pre-colonial uh, Nigeria, in Ibo land. Uh, so here you have, uh, you have a character that is really anti-Westernization, uh, uh, anti-Christian. Uh, uh, and then when you come to purple hibiscus, you have somebody who is, um, you know, uh, almost a religious fanatic, you know, uh, uh, almost to the point of abusing um, the children, physically abusing the children because uh, uh, on the eyes of God, um, the children are not doing what is supposed to be done. And, um, and, and thirdly, uh, here on Americana, uh, it's really about, um, you know, uh, migration uh, about campus life, uh, both Americana and uh, Purple Hibiscus are actually set at the University of uh, Nigeria in Nsuka. Incidentally, that is where uh, uh, Chimamanda's father was a professor of statistics at that particular university. So this is actually a story about race. Um, it is a story about migration. But it is a story about the failure of the modern African state to
to create um, an environment and, uh, and countries that uh, people can be able to thrive, that uh, the, the brightest do not have to look elsewhere in order to make a living, as Obinze and Ifemelu were looking forward to by going to America and England. Mm. Thank you for sharing those reflections, Prof, and for also sharing some of your experience and what resonates with you. Uh, Godwin, it looked like you wanted to add something there. Well, you also just looked like you expected me to say something. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so if I was, uh, if we're having the book uh, discussion in, uh, in uh, Sisutu Salebo, I would have said, Gila Galeo what the minister and the Prof. Marwala said. It's my, it's, uh, it's my word as well, but the, the reflection is mine. But let me add on to it. I mean, <clears throat> uh, I agree with uh, the reflections that have been made about the book. Uh, when I read the book, I just thought by the time I got to the end, and this is the second book of uh, Chimamanda's books that, Chimamanda's books that I've read. I've read a half of Yellow Suns, and I think there's some um, commonalities between the two books that I will uh, reflect on. But uh, when I got to the end of this book, I, the conclusion I got was, uh, you know, Ngozi was actually about to ex explode. She had, she was been carrying too many things, um, and she kind of uh, got that out uh, off her chest onto a book which is a good thing, you know? So <clears throat> all of us walk with, uh, you know, all sorts of things, observations and so on. Minister has been reflecting about what she sees, how she sees, sees things from government, you know, issues of uh, corruption and this and that and that so on. So, and, and here is Ngozi. I think, I think we, many of us are in the same situation. And I think one way of taking it out, it's actually, penning it down, but she's got a very interesting way of penning it down, a very, um, well, interesting book to read, but a bit annoying because you jump from one scene to the other. The one time you're in Nigeria, the other time you're in the US, in another state, in another, you know, university or you're in the UK, and they're like two big, you know, main characters, Obinze and herself, but it all ties back together. Um, which makes, uh, you know, at the end of the day, an interesting read. But what is this thing all about? I think, <clears throat> I think the writer actually could have used the same content to write a, a textbook on development. Because you just write about everything, you know, things that we deal with in life. So she writes about individuals, how individuals, um, you know, find their space in society, look for prosperity, look for sustenance and, and how they do that in, uh, within the allowances and, uh, and provisions of the state. And here it is an African state, a Nigerian state, which actually has not been providing enough, you know, for them to find uh, the kind of prosperity that they think of. And then they start reading these books about America, and they start thinking to go and look for um, such prosperity in other countries. Um, uh, so, so that was, you know, individuals in a state, and and then you get, you know, kind of power dynamics uh, between men and women, between men and men, you know, fighting for opportunities. And and basically, what you see throughout, it's a scramble for opportunities, up to a point where these two actually go out of the country to go and scramble for opportunities elsewhere. But the, the writer kind of keeps you reading um, by sprinkling some bit of romance, you know, throughout. Uh, interesting, Prof. Marwala did not pick that up and neither did the minister pick that up. So she sprinkles romance through the throughout. When you thought, you know, you're getting bored with these development issues and so on, she brings romance, you know, all the reason, you know, she and the Obinza start calling each other silly. I won't go into that. But, but, but all these, 
I think manifest in a number of isms, <clears throat> you know. So and and these are the isms that we deal with um, in in more serious ways. So it brings out uh, racism, you know, issues. It brings out gender, you know, dynamics. Actually, um, you know, something that we play down uh, many or many a times when you look at the isms. It actually brings out tribalism. So the Igbo and the Yoruba and whoever and how the, the, the various tribes, I mean, stick together and they do business together and so on. Um, you know, very interesting and in, in their cultures in, in that respect. It brings out class. So, um, you know, Obinza's mother was like a well-to-do lecturer. They had a university house. And, and in a sense, I mean, here is a familiar you know, FML finding space, you know, in that, you know, class, the class thing continues throughout. Even when Obinze is in the UK and he, all of a sudden, he swims in a bigger pool, a bigger pond, the class that he carried in Nigeria does not work in, uh, in, in, uh, in the UK. You know, there's different ways of maneuvering, you know, in the UK, um, in that sense. It, between countries, and once Obinze and, and Efemulo step out of the country, then it brings the thorny issue of xenophobia. So, they, I mean, you see a whole lot of institutionalized xenophobia in, uh, in, in, in the UK and as well as in the, in, the, in the US. It brings out religion, issues of religion, and religion comes out comes uh, out as as refuge so when people hit a wall um, you know they go to religion to interpret um, you know the circumstances and you can see the competition between religion and education uh, and education is presented as one way in which to open the doors so technically people pursue you know education to open the doors both if and Obinze, I mean, they had focused on getting educated. How does Aunt Uju, you know, uh, emancipate herself? She goes to the U.S. and when she gets to the U.S., she reads the books. She educates herself until she becomes a doctor and she finds a space in society. So there's education. But you do find education competing with religion, you know, from time to time. When things don't work out, oh, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, what the devil, huh? Eh? And uh, when things work out, you know, thanks God, it's God. Uh, so, in, in a sense, very interesting ways in which FMULA has, uh, in fact, um, um, Ngozi has brought up, you know, out or used different, uh, you know, issues and dynamics at, you know, personal, you know, individuals level, the state, and, and even between states. So, kind of global relationships and, and culture. But I don't confuse that with what, with the manifestations. The manifestations are a different thing. It's, the manifestations are a result of those basic things that happen around individuals, around the state, and how certain behaviors and treatments get, you know, institutionalized. Let me, let me stop there. <laughs> Thanks, Godwin. Um, I think all, all three of the speakers have kind of outlined for us very well some of the main themes that come out in the book. Um, and as Godwin, you've said, it could have been written as a textbook, uh, considering the number of social and political and economic um, topics that it raises. But the fact that it was written as a novel with these strong characters um, and a strong storyline that kind of draws you in, helps you to, um, to immerse yourself in some of those themes and understand them in a more personal and, uh, and a real way, a tangible way, which is also something that's coming through in the chat um, as people are saying they could really relate to the experiences that are um, articulated in the book and could sort of imagine themselves being in that position. Um, so maybe what we can do now is explore some of the themes that you've already mentioned, um, just go into them a bit deeper. Um, so the first one um, that I think everyone has mentioned was around race and racism. Um, and 
given that we are South Africans reading this book, which is set in the US and about um, African immigrants in America, um, how do you think the South African context or the, our South African background influenced your reading of the book? Um, and was there anything that you could relate to specifically in Ifemelu's discussions of race and racism? Um, maybe if I can go, if I can go. Obviously she touches even uh, complex uh, 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 topics such as what is the difference between an African-American and an American-African. Uh, I'm almost reminded of the time, uh, uh, in fact, more than twice. Uh, the first time I was accompanying um, uh, a friend of mine also from South Africa uh, to court because he had spared. As soon as they saw, they, 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 they had his accent, he was treated very well. In fact, uh, the case yeah. was this because automatically they realized that he was not African-American, but he was an American-African. Um, uh, the second thing was uh, uh, at one stage, uh, we went to a shop with a friend of mine from Nigeria uh, and, uh, and, and the police thought we were there to rob the shop, you know, and, um, and they came with guns and, uh, and when they heard our accents, they apologized immediately. And this idea of, uh, especially in a racially charged uh, environment, that uh, those who come from far away are better blacks, you know, uh, is something that is actually quite familiar uh, in South yeah. Africa. Uh, and of course, we have to be careful that uh, uh, it does not become uh, xenophobic, but uh, the issues that uh, uh, the locals don't work hard, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the locals don't work hard. It's something that I, I, I had when I was in the United States. So, 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 so those, those, those were some of the, uh, the topics. Um, and obviously, uh, when it comes to issues of um, uh, interracial uh, uh, and the presence of a black person na navigating in an environment like that, and this is the case uh, when Ifemelu fell in love with um, with Blaine, you know, uh, in well, in, in Baltimore, uh, you know, that uh, uh, all of a sudden things became easy for her. Again, uh, we can relate to uh, as South Africans. Mm, thank you for those reflections. Is there anything, Godwin or Minister? Matseha, if you would like to add to that. Now, just even before I respond to your question, I'm quite surprised that Godwin picked up what I found about the book. It's a beautiful book to read, but at some stage, it's, I was, it's not a book that I would read straight for three days, nonstop. It just doesn't allow a single flow, which when you want to read for pleasure, you can relax in reading the book. So I, I could only read it in chapters. So I will read and really get tired of it and then miss it, go back to the book. So it's not one read that I could do with the book. And I just, and I'm glad that Godwin raised it because I, I just, I mean, I normally when I pick up a book, I want to finish it in three days or <laughs> at most or two days, but it's not a book that I will wake up onto it in the next day and like, I mean, I was also reading at the same time with Elephant Whispers. It's, it's, it's an easy book. It's about elephants. It's about animals. It's a very relaxing book. And I could read it within a day. So I didn't feel there's too many topics that I have to deal with at the same time. Too many issues. Before you know it, you are in England. You are in, 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 in Nigeria. You are, you are, so, yeah. So I already did find it a very disruptive book because of the too many things. And maybe it's my reading culture that I really want. One thing, if I read about, um, I was also reading at the same time with a book written by a, rev a Catholic priest who works in prisons and was trying to investigate just the essence of criminality and what makes people to be violent. And, and those are some of the yeah, books. But coming back to your question, uh, having reflected, because I, I, I picked it up when Godwin was speaking. 
it also, as much as it made me sad about being black in, in the world and just how at all times we as Africans for different reasons have to keep on justifying ourselves. If you have curly heads, it becomes a problem. You have to go and bend it out if you have to. So, and the different complexes that as Africa or as black people we have to, 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 to do and how it impacts on our self-esteem and therefore just throws apart our, our, our being. I mean, these women who, she's got two boyfriends, this other one at the hair salon, she wants to get married. And it's a feeling that I always feel very uncomfortable about being a woman that to, you just want to get married. So it's, it's anything, it's a taxi driver, it's anything, as long as it's a man, he qualifies to, to be a husband and uh, yeah, so anything can be how dirty, but as long as it's a man, and that's why even when you drive your own car, you find a, a truck driver, a, 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 a passenger and a truck driver, and then we, a, a waves at you and really makes all the whistles and feels that because you're a woman, you can be anything you think you want to be, but at the end of the day, you're a woman. And we also seem to accept that anything that has trousers really is superior. And the, the biggest price it can give us is when they marry us. It doesn't matter whether they love us or not, but they have to marry us. And that's what we want. And just that desperation. But also I felt quite proud to be a South African. And I just felt that with all our difficulties, I don't see South African kids feeling so desperate that if you have a foreign passport, you are better off. And I, I, I just don't think South Africans, South African black children, even how difficult it is, do feel that a, a foreign passport is the best ticket. I know, for instance, amongst most black South Africans, an accent, a foreign accent might be good, but it's not necessarily the end of the day. People are proud of their own local accent. So that desperation that comes with that came from the, the, from the book. I just felt that I, at least as South Africans, we still have our dignity. We don't have to be that desperate. We don't go to overseas countries to go and stay there. We know things are not good at home, but we always want to come back home and we're always hopeful. And it just said to me, I hope God, we never reach a stage where our kids don't have any hope in their country and just want the first thing out and the, uh, and the dignity is with so that's how, that's how it struck me also as South African to say, well, it's tough, but I don't think we've reached the stage. And as Prof is saying also, my reflection in terms of even this African versus African, it's just such a complex issue, which really makes it painful for me as an African woman to, to have to justify your looks. So everything about you is wrong and everything about anything that is not you is, is right. And you, you sometimes seem to accept that as real because you, you know that's how the world is judging you. But on the other hand, you, <laughs> you, you even yourself, this xenophobia, tend to oppress each other in terms of what the world thinks about you. And, and that's the sad part of it all about the book and what it means to be an African in the world all over, whether in America or England, it just have to justify yourself and you can't be good enough and you have accepted that you even undermine other Africans because you yourself don't feel inadequate and that's how I related to it as a book but I felt proud to be South African to say uh, we've not reached that stage. Thank you. So, Catherine, if I can add and I want to pick it up from where the <clears throat> minister has left it. Um, so I think as South Africans indeed we are in a slightly different um, you know, situation. But uh, when I read the book, I mean, I looked at other countries. So in other countries, the youth would actually travel, not because they're looking for opportunities, but to go and learn, to go and see other things. And they come back and they make their country strong. Um, I mean, we shouldn't compare to countries like Singapore, but uh, in Singapore, they would deliberately send more people out to go and learn. They bring back skills and they bring back money and that sort of thing. Um, and I know it kind of UJ and other universities is, you know, promotion of getting our own young people to go out, you know, and see things and so on. In that context, <clears throat> I mean, I looked at Obinze and, uh, and FM Muller and, and I thought, what is the way out 
when you find your situation, when you find yourself in that situation, what's your way out? And I could not help but get to two conclusions. One is that um, you, need to sh you need to change uh, the, the role of institutions into an enabling one from one that constrains and, and actually hold people down. But secondly, from an individual uh, point of view, you gotta build resilience because there is competition. So let me start with the uh, you know, individual one. I mean, even within the country, we gotta build resilience. And let me, let me give an example with uh, Nigerians. Look, I mean, Nigerians are very resilient. Nigerians are very resilient. Go to any city in the world, you find Nigerians and, and they, they make it, you know, they, in, in South Africa, in, if you walk in Oxford Street in London, I mean, there's lots of Nigerians and they're making it. They just make things work. And I think there's a thing about building resilience at an individual level. But let me talk about institutions. Um, so we've got to build institutions that enable people to realize their dreams and so on. And when we talk to institutions, and I know many a times we stop at government, but building institutions actually goes beyond, you know, government. We have to, you know, ensure that we have a government that actually makes it possible for people to realize their dreams and so on. But when we talk institutions, we talk the church, we talk uh, the family, we talk uh, civil society, you know, organizations and so on. We're going to have to have a close knit of institutions that enable people to realize, you know, their dreams. Um, and it takes time, I mean, to build those institutions. And a part of the institutions are actually trapped in culture. So minister talks about, um, <clears throat> you know, most of these, uh, you know, women in the, in the book, I mean, all they're looking forward to is to be married. All they're looking forward to is to find a man who can, you know, provide. I mean, that's, that's a factor of institution. So these cultural institutions, I mean, uh, push the idea that, you know, the men must provide, you must get a brigadier. Was he brigadier? Uh, and would you say, uh, boyfriend, you know? General, yeah. General, as good as a brigadier. You must get a general who must provide and, and everywhere else, I mean, even in the US, I mean, she kind of got, you know, the blames and the cat and so on. Um, they, they, they come in as provider. Even Aunt Uju in, uh, in, in the US, she, she then gets this husband um, because she wants somebody who can provide over and above, you know, kind of a, getting a second born. And he's a completely useless guy, you know? He doesn't take care of her. Instead of giving, he sucks, you know, from her emotionally, materially, and otherwise. So um, this whole notion of institutions, I think um, better equipped institutions and institutions that are focused on enabling in, you know, individuals to you know, realize their, their, their hopes and goals in life is the one thing that we have to focus on in, in, uh, in, in development. But perhaps lastly, um, um, I mean, race, race is not, I want to argue, I mean, race is not about everything. You know, race is intertwined with many other things. And I think it's not enough to just focus on race. Uh, we've got to focus on the other dynamics that go with race, you know, gender, um, um, these other issues and and you know uh, tribalism and, and that sort of thing, uh, and I just think that there's another side you know to race. In our country, we've got a different experience of race. The commonality with most countries where black people are, are minority is that, of course, I mean you know white people are, are seen as you know um, the better race and so on. Uh, but in this country, uh, the, the population you know, numbers are in reverse. I mean, you've got more black people and you have less, you know, white people and so on. Um, this thing about race with all the racial groups agreeing, it should be much easier in South Africa to reverse the racial, you know, frontiers um, given the population, you know, patterns. Um, and in fact, I think one of the things um, to encourage 
is to get white, more white people to recognize race for what it is. And, and for us to kind of, you know, calling race something else. And it's all about having to do what we have to do as the differ, different racial groups to push back these ills about, you know, race and then due use of, you know, race to oppress others. Thanks, Godwin. Um, I think you also raised an important point about how um, all of these issues like um, like race and sexism and class are all intertwined. Um, and that's something that definitely comes through very strongly in the novel. Um, and Minister, you also mentioned it, um, just the, the different representations of Black women um, and their multifaceted struggles. Um, some to do with race, some to do with their gender, um, some to do with class and uh, also location in terms of um, being an immigrant in an unfamiliar country. Um, I think one of the, I guess one of the themes that brings a lot of these issues together is the idea of fitting in or uh, being your authentic self. Um, and that's seen in quite a few of the different characters, um, like Auntie Uju in the novel, um, changes the way that she pronounces her name, uh, that changes the way that she does certain things um, to fit into the American culture that she's in. Uh, whereas Ifemelu makes a very conscious decision to not change her accent and to keep the same, keep speaking the same way that she has spoken before. Um, and so as a reader, what was your reaction to, to that idea of assimilating, uh, assimilating to a dominant culture in order to survive sometimes or in order to advance and um, accomplish the things that you would like to accomplish, uh, whatever those are? Do you think that it's okay to compromise um, to a certain extent? Uh, do you think there's a limit to it? Or how did you feel it out in the novel? No, no, uh, well, uh, assimilation is, uh, is a survival, is a survival, is, uh, and assimilation happens across the world. Uh, for example, during the Second World War, many Schmids in the United States who were otherwise German became Smith because they do not want to be associated with, uh, uh, with uh, the, uh, uh, the Second World War. Uh, the outgoing president of, uh, of the United States. You know where all our Germans ended up, Masna? Oh. The Germans here in this country. Oh. No, they come from England. Just a reminder to everyone to please mute yourself if you are not one of the panelists. Thanks. The, the, the outgoing president of the United States, Trump, I was reading about uh, his father, who was German. He, he went around saying he was not German. He was actually uh, Norwegian because uh, he did not want to be associated with, uh, with them. So the idea of, 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 of assimilation is a survival instinct. Uh, 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 and I don't think I, I would be uh, uh, judgmental about it. One thing for sure, what I have seen is that um, assimilation does not necessarily mean that you have abandoned your traditions, languages, and so on and so forth. I have seen many Chinese in the United States who have uh, assimilated, but when you dig deeper, you realize that no, uh, the accent is just deceptive. You know, uh, they are they still practice. Um, their religions, they still mm -hmm. observe their, um, uh, 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 their holidays and so on and so forth. So, uh, so, so, so I, I guess this is my view, you know, uh, that uh, uh, I'm not judgmental about it. As long as you are proud of who you are, as long as you know uh, uh, what you're doing, as long as you don't forget who you are, uh, um, then, then I think uh, it is okay to, to try to uh, to, 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 to assimilate uh, um, uh, in order to, to, to move forward. So can I, you know, I agree with, uh, with Prof. Um, 
and perhaps to understand the power and the effects of assimilation, one needs to bring in what happens if you're not assimilated. You get pushed out. Um, you clearly just get pushed out. So, um, and then the next question that follow is, what is the best way of a surviving in that space? Uh, is it influencing from inside or from outside? Um, if, if, you're, if you're assimilated, I mean, if you play within the assimilation space, you are able to influence things from you know, inside. And I think correctly, correctly pointed out, as long as one does not forget who or who he or she is. But this reminds me of a, actually a very boring book whose end I, I enjoyed very much, uh, The Sellout by Paul Beatty. Um, also enjoyed you know, that book. You also enjoyed it. Uh, I, I didn't enjoy the insults and I kind of made sure that my kids were far from it when I read it. But when you get to the end, I just, fi I just find it so powerful because race is the manifestation of how we engage with each other in public. So if, if, you, if you kept the things in yourself and you practice it at home and it doesn't come in the public space, then it doesn't manifest. And when it manifests there, Paul Beatty, in fact, I think what's important is what you then get to do about it. And Paul Beatty, uh, interestingly, ends up with about three, four or five uh, categories of, uh, of people. In fact, he starts by saying, to understand racism in the US, you've got to understand blackness. And, and he says, to understand blackness, you can understand blackness through, you know, like four categories. And, and uh, look, I'm just paraphrasing, forgive me for what he says, but he says the first group, <clears throat> the first uh, group is um, a group of people who kind of glorify white people. So um, who's the basketball player, Jordan? Uh, and he mm -hmm. says, these guys will go, he even gives examples of Americans, very <laughs> prominent Americans. And he, he says, you know, Michael Jordan will go and marry a white, you know, woman for that matter. And we see that amongst a whole lot of successful black people. Once they get successful, they want to go and marry a white person, right? And then the second category, he says, uh, um, these are people who kind of see, observe, and experience racism, but they do nothing about it. So... They wake up and go to work and things happen around them. Uh, they say nothing as long as they survive themselves in that space. The third one, he says, no, no, no. It's guys who actually have stood up to do something about racism, right? Like the Malcolm X's and whoever. And so they really get into the thing to do, um, um, to do something about racism. And then the next one, I mean, they're like, very, very, you know, um, very, very kind of aggressive. They don't want to see this thing called, you know, racism, you know. The minute it raises its head, they go for it, they want to chop it. Yeah, like that. And the last one are like black people who are like, they just against white people. So anything that a white person says is wrong, it, that they don't get to reason it, you know. <laughs> I, I don't want to give like South African examples, but you can think of some people. Um, they just don't listen to anything that uh, the, the white people say. But the most interesting of my read of that book and the conclusion was that I shared it with my kids who were fairly young. And in fact, they go to a, a bilingual school and they've experienced racism and they've come home and I've sent them back and say, ah, go and deal with it. You know, tell these people, now you're a South African. They can't do that. You live with other people, that sort of thing. And then my kids, when I explain to them and say, hey, this, and then they say, so, Papa, can you tell me what category are you? So, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm like, I want to ask Professor Marwala, what category are you? You know, are you one? Are you two? Are you three? Are you four or five? But I, I just find that it, it presents a very interesting 
way of actually a structured way of looking at you know what you get to do um, in response to racism when it it raises its head. I think that kind of uh, an approach can very well be used by you know white people who happen to be on the other side of the race dynamics because this race thing it's all about all of us having to do what we need to do. We gotta act on it on a daily basis until we push back these frontiers. And I think it's the only way we actually change the institutions uh, that promote, uh, you know, kind of undue and undesirable racial segregation. Thanks, Karen. Um, yeah, okay. interesting points. I, uh, Minister I like what Sonia Lennon has Lennon Lennon. posted here, really about these issues. He says the book represents the need of creating a new, more complete world of ourselves, and I really like what she's posted. He, he he's posted, and I, I think we we should read all of it. it. Just this whole question about assimilation reminds me of two stories that I want to go into. But I'd love, I love what Sanele has said, but also what Mbebe says that it it it, 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 it uh, you find it quite difficult. He says you you find it easy to assimilate because as a teenager you're still trying to find yourself in the midst. I once visited France and there was this fellow which I took quite seriously because we had gone to a UNESCO conference. It was you not know, just this African, you're happy for another African in a predominantly white country. And he put me off the way he was excited that he's just got an American passport. And it was as if he's a, a, a French passport. It was as if now he's become France. He's so happy about it. He's so blessed, he's even celebrating. And just even, because France has this culture of saying, of, of encouraging people to assimilate and or creating an impression that you can be French when you are not French. And I looked at him quite sadly and said, hey, let me not judge him, but this is bad in some. You know, when I started, I, I taught at the Soweto College, went to Vets for a year. And I was quite young. I think I was in my early 20s. And it was before the unbanning. Uh, just at the height of apartheid, vets was beginning to have black academics. I couldn't last for a year. I just, because we were very, very few Africans then. It just was so burdensome for me to be in a company, in an, an environment where I was expected not to be me. And you know, were, you could feel that there are certain expectations that you are this African that has gone through. Here you are, you are with us and everybody's condescending on you. and everybody's trying to accommodate you. And I just found it nerve wracking and, and went back to, 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 to teaching in the township where I felt at home with my people and I could be anything and there are no expectations. But because I wanted to pursue my studies, I had to condition myself to say, what, this is my country, I'm going back and I'm going to remind them that uh, I, I, I'm me. I'm speaking this way. I've, I speak English the way I can. I can speak my home language fluently and quite good. So no one's going to teach me any accent as long as they understand what I'm saying. And it took so much of me to really go back to vets now to say, you know what, I'm, go I'm going to assert myself that I'm a black African woman, I'm a Sutu woman, I'm not English, and I'm using English just to communicate and not because I want to be like them and I'm fine as I am. But it just takes so much to, especially if you are young, to consci consciously say, I'm going to assert myself. I'm not going to be part of what I am not. I am going to be part of the academic world. I'm going to do that, which is going to make me an academic, not to be white or anything, and make me a successful academic. And that's the path I'm choosing. Those are the things I'm choosing about VETS. But everything else that denies the fact that I'm African and I'm who I am, and I speak the way I speak, I'm not even going to make an effort to try and choke myself to speak with an accent for them to accept me. It's not going to happen. And I'm not even going to dress like them. I'm a township kid. I like being overdressed. If they like being untidy, I'm not going to be like that. It's me. I, I, I want to wear, wear my stilettos. I could see really that the environment, I just felt that normal. I'm not going to, to be wearing techies and other things. I'm young, I, 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 I'm a township kid. I grew up wanting to dress smartly and I'm going to do it. But it takes so much out of you 
to be able to fight that battle psychologically. And I think sometimes it's even unfair for young people because you want to be focused. You don't want to try and justify yourself or to be swallowed until in such time you no longer remember who you are and how you look like and what is it that you are. You have to, yeah, to change your complexion, change your face, change the way. It, it, it should come because it's a decision that you made that I want to wear long hair. I want to change my complexion, but not because I want to look like anything that is not me. It's because I want to look like this, because I want I want to, to look like this. Thank you so much, um, I think you raised like, so many important points there about the, the complexities of navigating all different identities and different spaces. Um, and one of the things that um, I think God Marwala also raised was how you could, to a certain extent, assimilate to a space, um, but still maintain your sense of identity and knowing who you are. Um, and I know that uh, one of the one of the comments I think from Selayelo mentioned the role of language in that, um, and how in the book uh, Anti Uju doesn't speak Igbo to her son uh, DK, and he has we see the effects of that and also other ways that she's raising him later on where he doesn't really have a sense of his identity as uh, as a Nigerian or as an African. Um, and so what do you think about the role of language also um, in the South African context in terms of identity and assimilation and how we kind of navigate in this multilingual space that we're living in? Um, some of the other comments also speak about how lots of young people in South Africa are multilingual and are able to transition between many different spaces. Um, is that something that you've experienced or seen? I mean, I, language is a, it's a, a difficult one, isn't it? I mean, <clears throat> I, I just, maybe I've gotten to a point where I'm lazy to think about these things because I always make a look back to, you know, institutions. So, you know, institutions not as like uh, buildings or organizations, but institutions as a set of systems, cultures, values and principles and so on. So here's a country that has been subjected to an institution called apartheid. So up to the age of a uh, 20, well, 16, when I went to university, I I hadn't met any other, like, other language speaker than, you know, sh you know, stronger speaking people, uh, except for the few, uh, you know, uh, northern Sutu people who kind of came to settle in a in a in a village. The only lucky people were people who were that who stayed in, like Soweto and that sort of thing, because you then get mix, you know, of people, and I think. In some way, you could, you know, reverse policies and, and so on. But that apartheid institution, a set of systems, processes, values, and principles, in some way continues. Um, and, and it requires, you know, more than policies to reverse, um, you, you know, uh, uh, to, re to reverse those kind of practices. How exactly you do it, I, I, I am not sure. And I mean, I, I suppose it takes, like, work you know, people um, at an individual level or, or a network of such people to work together um, and, and, and to kind of make more people aware of the need to be proud of who we are. At the core of it is identity and how we develop our own identities. Again, it's influenced by, you know, institutions and the kind of, you know, confidence that we get, whether, uh, you know, the bit of it is influenced by education and the setup uh, the education, you know, set up in the education institution that allows for various languages to actually, you know, uh, be be practiced. I hope we don't talk, you know, policy, but I mean, part of it, um, you know, gets, you know, promoted by policy. But interestingly, <clears throat> along language, uh, so, so race, the manifestations of like race, language, the language dynamics, uh, and I can't, I can't help it, but the story starts with uh, Effie, uh, you know, at a salon, 
you know, doing her hair and the dynamics around the stretched hair and and then this whole thing about stretched hair and kinky hair continues throughout, you know, the whole, uh, uh, you know, book. And, and hair is about one of those things, right? Alongside, you know, language. I mean, was it two years ago, the hair policy and the uh, Victoria uh, Girls High School. I mean, early this year, we had a whole, you know, uh, private sector company, uh, a shop actually that was, you know, perpetuating uh, this uh, prejudice and perceptions, wrong perceptions about, um, you know, African hair and identity and, and, and that sort of thing. So uh, again, I, it's a it's a big institution that needs to be, you know, in a sense dismantled. Um, and at the center of it is identity and how we allow you know people to embrace their own identity. And there's nothing wrong, you know, with people embracing their own identity as long as there is kind of proper avenues and grounds for various you know cultures and so on to yield and accommodate you know. Uh, you know, the others. Mm -hmm. Thanks, um, maybe just to come on the issue of, uh, of language, uh, uh, what obviously uh, uh, at our university, what we have seen is that there are many languages that are being spoken on campus, much more than 11 official languages of South Africa. Mm -hmm. So you will have uh, Shona being spoken, you will have uh, Portuguese being spoken, you will have uh, all sorts of languages. You know? so, so, so that is actually quite good. But I also do feel, I mean, this is now a personal issue, uh, that, um, that uh, uh, you know, as we move on, there will be a need for us to be able to create uh, a, a, a language that we can be able to, an African language that uh, we can all be able to speak so that we can have economies of, of, of scale. Uh, the reason for that is because uh, uh, if we are going to build uh, the African language database, which is basically, uh, 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 you know, uh, quite important, then we will need economies of scale. I've heard that uh, Julius Mnyelele decided that uh, Swahili is going to be an official language in, in, uh, uh, in, in, in Tanzania. And you can imagine how controversial that move is. Uh, then I was reading about uh, India, uh, because every time I go to India, I realize that many people can actually speak Hindi. Um, uh, then I realized that no, Hindi is actually not, was not a universally spoken language at independence. And uh, the debates about uh, adopting one indigenous language for all regions were so heated that many people said, uh, we might as well just stick with English, you know, and, and so on and so forth. And I can imagine in South Africa, if you, if you put uh, the issue of having one Big African, one African language that uh, everybody, when they go to school, they are supposed to, to take. It can be controversial, but I think it's very important, especially given the fact that now when I look at technological gadgets, I see all our languages being left behind. I see you know, technology not being able to understand our languages. I, I see uh, 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 our languages becoming much, much more anglicized. I, I'm, I watch a, a, a show uh, called The River on TV. Um, the beauty about it is that they speak in all our 11 official languages as if uh, uh, it is one language. But I am, I, I am surprised by how much English, how, how, how many English words have become common in our languages. And the meaning of that is something that we'll have to uh, uh, to try to understand. But um, what I can see is that if the trend continues 50 years from today, our languages will be virtually extinct. They will be there. We will just be using lots of words from other languages. I think it's a very important issue to be discussed, but it's, it's sensitive 
uh, and, uh, and something that uh, should be held in good care. You know, my view on language is that as much as I would support a situation where we find a common language amongst ourselves, it's to separate between a language for business, for communication, for learning and other things. So really it's, it's, it's a technical it's a instrument through which we can relate to each other. But what saddens me also, especially with African parents around language is that we're so privileged to have so much wealth in terms of the languages that we have in the idiom, in the philosophy, in the worldview. So we're not only losing on the language part, but we lose on the worldview that has been carried from generations to generations. You know, personally, when I find very difficult situations, I tell you it's the African idiom that shakes me off and make me just get the strength to move on. So not language really as a means of communication, but as values that are instilled. You know, when we were children, my father used to, when you sleep, you'd say, my child, there's no cow you're going to, in Sutu, one sentence you're going to get from sleeping. And I just jump if it, 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 it comes to my mind because it's been instilled with, uh, in me as a, you know, as part of me. So it's not been language in terms of business, but language as values and as cultures. Even when we were taking decisions about exams, you get, you listen to everybody. And all the time, I remember what my grandmother used to say, say my child, the, the, the donkey didn't reach the market. Then I just know that it's time to take a decision because it came also from the stories she told me about how being indecisive can finally be dangerous. And you reach a stage where you feel just completely helpless. You don't know which way to go. And the African idiom just wakes you up to say, you know what, at some stage, whether you get hurt or not, you have to take a decision. And the last one that I really want to share with people, because I'm very passionate about the language thing and feel quite sad that South African parents are not encouraging, their, they're not using the language to, 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 to instill certain values without being didactic, preaching and others, and just throwing an idiom. I mean, we speak different languages with my husband in the house and we throw them at each other. And sometimes they silence even the debate. Uh, in the house when he throws a very strong idiom at me, then I know what it means. And it just sinks deeper than if he was going to tell me this is very irritating and other things. You know, I can share this with you because it's, it's, it's a, I, I think there's, I hope there's nothing wrong. There was a time in the NEC when we had such a big fight when Julius was still a member of the ANC. And it was such a tense and difficult meeting. And somebody just stood up and says, here we're dealing with the king's dog. And we all knew what it meant, that the king, there was a king's dog at the palace. It could sneak and sniff anybody's food. You couldn't touch it, because it's the king's dog. But it did that to the king's food. And the king tried to, 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 to beat it up, and it went for the king. So <laughs> this person says, yeah, we're dealing with the king's dog. And we all knew that what he meant. He didn't have to say, you cost it on yourself. So, and that's what I think we're going to be missing if we don't look after the African language, the idiom, the philosophy, the worldview that it brings. And from there, the meeting was silent because no one could, could deny the fact that we're dealing with the king's dog here. The king's dog is eating the king. And there's nothing you can do as ordinary uh, 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 villagers because this dog has been insulting everybody and no one was bringing to order. So for me, it, it's very important that we we, we, and that's why when they were talking about accents and other things, I said, that will be a set day where our languages could be a, a, a language where we get embarrassed about the languages we speak, we get embarrassed about what it brings with us. I'm very excited that we're talking about bringing Kiswahili, because I think it will even bring more of the African idiom, more of the African philosophy to enrich our children's worldview about our continent, about us, but about the world, uh, the way our, our parents would have seen it. And I'm really hoping that parents will not let go of, of, of the languages. And we're lucky. As I said, we have so many languages. 
My husband speaks three from the north, I speak three from the south, and we throw them at each other and they help to resolve some of the difficult things without arguing, like it resolved the matter at the NEC when uh, people said, I was dealing with the king's dog here, there's nothing we can do. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much for all those reflections. I think um, all three of you have raised um, some of the complexities behind language and how it is not just about language, not just about communication, but it's a carrier of culture and values um, and identity. And as Godwin, you mentioned, um, it's used in, in the novel, but there's also other kind of symbols that are used like hair, um, which you mentioned as a symbol of identity and um, as also assimilation and the complexities of that. Um, I think we are running out of time. So maybe just as a last question um, to each of the panelists, um, as you reflect on this book as a whole, um, what is your, your key take out or your central message um, that you've kind of picked up from your, from your reading of the book um, and that you would like to end off with as we conclude our discussion? <laughs> as I said, when we started, I really loved the book. And as I said, it wasn't a, it's, it's not a one thing book. It's, it's a book that helps you that when you feel tired, there are court decisions, you just say, hey, let me go to Ngozi's book and just disengage. And you know, it's going to talk about something different, which you didn't expect it will, it will be talking about. So I just read in terms of the themes that it comes, it was helpful as a, I said it's a stop and read book. You read and stop. You you, you read, stop, read. I, I, I did find it a, a, a good in that sense. But as I said earlier, it really felt familiar. And this process, I really hope, Godwin, we will continue with it. I mean, even the posts that I hear just excite me. It allows us to, to, to be talking. And because it's got many themes, it brings so many things. We're able to talk about different things at the same time, but still speaking about the same thing. So I, I do hope that, you know, we are starting with a revolution that we need as South Africans. When I started off, Ketri, I said, when we were analyzing what makes it difficult for us as South Africans to succeed in our reading campaign, what in our reading process in schools, what came out starkly, which I didn't expect was that they compared, they did a research on your Moroccos and others, our, our friends at the bottom. They looked at your Russia and other people on top to say what makes them to be winning nations when it comes to reading. And it came to the conclusion that they are reading nations, not reading schools. They are reading nations. And that's why they were successful as, as nations, not even as schools. Ourselves and Moroccos and others at the bottom we were not doing well because we are non-readers. And which is what Prof said, if you don't read, maybe you should not lead. Because, yeah, you can't deny the fact that reading, even for pleasure, helps you to relax and deal with your soul. For me, in this very difficult period, it was a nice read and stop, read and stop book, which helps to disengage, brings different world views different stories at that stage. As you say, there's a romance, there's what the adults were supposed to be successful, but you find themselves subjecting themselves to generals. You've got young girls who you don't know. I mean, they, are, they should be looking after themselves and looking for any, any man of the men to marry them. So you can see that, I mean, Gozi really touched it on the whole world in one and which makes it a great book. But for me, it also makes it a very good conversation point uh, as, 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 a, as an African book, but also as a foreign book that has the, the world around it. Yeah, but as a reflection also for us as Africans about our situation in the world, which sometimes is very sad, let alone that ourselves as, a, our, as governments, we're not making our lives any better with all the wealth that we have been blessed with. We're just not making our, our world and our life any better for our children and for our people. And that's what I found it very sad to say. I mean, Nigeria should be with all the, I mean, I've been there with all the wealth, there's rain, there's food, there's everything. 
there's academics, there are intellectuals, but things just don't seem to, 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 to be getting together, just seem to be falling apart all the way and just not getting right. Yeah, but thanks for the opportunity to, to really have this conversation. And I say I was reading also the post and the charts here. And yeah, so it really made um, a very exciting. I'm going to, to communicate with the president to say you missed out, man. Uh, <laughs> you had your, your equals waiting for you. Say you read 50 books a year. Let, let's come and talk about them so that you don't tell us that you read 50. Come and talk about those books. So I hope in the next cycle he'll be able to come because he really, really uh, loves this program and we'll communicate with him to say through your assistance, uh, your Nalibal and everybody else, this has become a reality. And for that, I think we are eternally grateful and appreciative of the postings, postings that I hear bomb for. And I thought it, it was actually very nice even to have the chats on the side. They, they were very helpful. So we didn't feel like you're speaking alone, speaking a lot because people were engaging through the chats and it's a very beautiful, I think, interactive opportunity that we've had. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Thank you so much, Minister, and thank you for giving us this much of your time. We really appreciate having your voice in the conversation. I think lots of people on the chat um, had positive things to say about uh, your inputs during the conversation. So, no, no, thank you very much. I think, uh, once again, I would like to thank uh, uh, the Minister for, for creating this platform for all of us to come and speak about the books. I personally I am passionate about uh, books. Uh, I also would like to bring another dimension to, uh, to reading, which is uh, that we also need to start writing. You know? We need to start writing much more than we are writing. You know, uh, it is actually quite uh, uh, difficult uh, to find, uh, I don't know, I don't know, sound uh, elitistic. Uh, to find uh, uh, serious books from South Africa. Uh, uh, and the question that I have been asking myself is whether we are replacing, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Baba Eskayam Patel uh, Petain, uh, uh, you know, Walisi Rote, all those beautiful writers poetry, of, uh, of, 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 of fiction, uh, uh, are, we, are we replacing them? You know? Uh, um, you know, did the disappearance of the African writer series, if you remember those beautiful books that came out of those uh, series, has it killed uh, serious book writing in South Africa? Yes, we do have pockets of excellence, but we certainly are not producing books at the scale of our 16 million uh, uh, population, you know, uh, and I think that is something that we, we ought to think about. Uh, now, uh, 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 quite recently, I, I, I also discussed a book called um, We Need New Names, written by a young person from, from Nigeria, uh, from, from Zimbabwe, uh, no Violet Bulawai from, 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 yeah. from Zimbabwe. Uh, and and, and, and uh, with, with similar uh, uh, theme. Uh, and one of the things that obviously I'm quite interested to, to see is that uh, these books, especially books written by Africans, they need to be prescribed in our schools. I, I was actually quite uh, excited to see that uh, uh, when I was reading Purple Hibiscus, I, I just realized that my son, who is doing grade 11, was also reading it at school. So, uh, so we need to... We, 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 we obviously need... Uh, it looks like... Yeah, please, please make sure you're on mute if you're enjoying this. So, uh, so, so it is important that we... We write. Could you please mute? Tokwe, 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 mute. Yeah, so, so as we encourage people to write, we should support them 
by making sure that their books are prescribed in our schooling system so that we can be able to, uh, to have more writers uh, and create a much more uh, richer ecosystem of, of writing. But finally, uh, uh, one thing that we never really discussed, which is a topic that uh, if you live overseas, you see it quite a bit. Uh, this idea of people getting married, it's normally men, African men, uh, getting married in order to get a green card or in order to get, uh, uh, just as Obinze Ob did, uh, uh, get married, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, and the exploitative nature of that uh, industry. In this case, uh, um, in this book, it was a, a, a group of, uh, of Angolans who had taken uh, this woman uh, to be married by Obinze for no other reason except the fact that uh, they wanted Obinze to get uh, uh, a British work, working visa. Uh, it's, it's, it's actually quite a, a, an important topic, even in South Africa. Uh, we, we do hear stories around this, and I think it's a, it's a theme that uh, also needs its own exploration. Thank you. So, Catherine, for me, I mean, I think the book has been a very, uh, you know, interesting mirror uh, for all of us in South Africa and as Africans and how we interface, you know, with the world and so on. Um, so very interesting in that respect. Uh, I couldn't help it, <clears throat> but the more we discuss it, the more I kind of come back to the whole concept of being conscious Africans. Um, um, and and is the, that should, I think, underline the, you know, identity. If we consciously see ourselves as Africans, as it were, but much has been said in the discussions and the chats, so I won't go back to that. Uh, I think that uh, the next time around, we must uh, uh, double the numbers that we've had. It's a good start, very encouraging. I've seen uh, Michael, uh, Karen, who is our link from uh, GCIS as uh, comment, um, we do have to indeed, I mean, um, increase these numbers. One way of increasing the numbers is to bring, get more of your friends to join, uh, firstly to register on the president's, you know, reading cycle, um, so that we can have, you know, your details and we could be in touch with yourselves. Um, secondly, uh, Prof. Marwala and Minister and everyone, Perhaps the next time we should uh, sit comfortably with our own families, um, because that's how I think we can make the cycle bigger. Uh, Prof. Marwala, uh, you must bring doctor and you must bring uh, the kids there. Um, it's interesting how if you get a book read in a family, it all of a sudden creates a common ground and conversation and that sort of thing. Perhaps we could influence our very institutions you know, smallest institutions, which are families, to get to read the same book once a year. Uh, and maybe we don't have to say, uh, go and do things for yourself. The next time, minister, we could just say, the zebra does not have horns because it sent the cow to bring it a pair of horns. So the story goes like, the zebra was too lazy and it asked the cow to bring the set of horns uh, for it. And all the cow did, when it got there, it got the horns and it fixed on itself. And that's why the zebra does not have the horns for itself. Uh, so if you do things for yourself, you make sure that you have the horns. But minister, in my usual cheeky way, I want to uh, ask you to challenge the president to please choose his own favorite books. We will, all of us will read his uh, favorite book and will fit into his diary the next time so that he too can sit and discuss the book uh, and express his love for books and exuberate um, the very, you know, love for books that runs in his uh, bloodstreams. But thank you very much to um, the team. Thank you to the NRC team, the Read to Lead team, and <clears throat> the um, other... Uh, 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 you know, partners of the, the NRCs, uh, Nalibali, and, and many others that work with the NRC to promote the culture of reading. It's much easy 
to change compliance related aspects it's more challenging to change culture related you know aspects uh, but i think it's a challenge that we must square up to and you know try and get more and more south africans you know e embrace the love for books and express the love for books so that our kids as well may learn to love to read books and therefore reinforce in that way reinforce what happens in the classrooms